Good morning to everybody. So we have to continue the structural organization of animals. So far we completed the structural organization of earth. Just what we have an analyte and form. And we have to study something about the pest. What we have the household pest. A vector for many diseases. Cockroach. So it is one of the pests, you know that one, a nocturnal animal living in our houses, in crevices, and also between the cracks. Coming out mostly during the night time, very active during the night time. That's why it's called as a nocturnal animal. As it causes a number of diseases, spreading the disease, it is called as a pest. That too also affects us, causes damage to our household articles also. Now let's see the taxonomical hierarchy or the systematic position of this organism. As it is having, you know that one jointed legs, it is coming at an arthropoda, jointed legs, animals with the jointed legs. And the universal ruler or the universal character of all insects, how can you identify an insect from that of a spider? An insect is having normally three pairs of legs. Three pairs of legs. That's a common character. It is different from the spider, the one which is having four pairs of legs. That's why the subphylum is called as hexapoda, animals with the six legs. Animals with the six legs. Then the class insecta, the body is insectified, divided into head, thorax, and abdomen. In the name, that is insect. Subclass pterygota. So, in the case of class insecta, we have nearly 29 orders. Some of the insects have no wings at all. They are called a pterygos, a pterygos. For example, the head louse or the bed bug. These are all the animals which do not have any just two wings. That is what they call as wingless insect. That is coming under a pterygota. A pterygota. Animals without wings or insects without wings. But here the class, subclass pterygota, which includes the cockroaches, grasshoppers, etc., even the beetles. Now we have the coleoptera. So here it includes cockroaches and grasshoppers. And they have the wings, well developed wings. Hence the name pterygota. Now, superordered dictyoptera, having two pairs of wings, having two pairs of wings, having two pairs of wings. Then we have the order. Blotoidea or blotoidea. So, blotoidea or blotoidea. Both are correct. Blotoidea or blotoidea. Now, there is a super order that the family Blachidae and also we have the genus, what we have the Indian cockroach, Periplaneta, and the species American. The species American. So, this is what we have the systematic position of the organism. Now, a general description about the cockroach. I mentioned already, these animals are nocturnal. Feeding on all types of food materials, anything else. Hence called omnivores. Feeding on all types of food materials. <coughs> and a serious pest causing damage to our household articles. And also spreading the disease to different organisms. So, pest, the one which causes damage to our household articles. <coughs> Sorry. Vectors. And now, normally, a vector is an organism which can carry a disease producing organism from one individual to another. So, they carry a number of disease causing organisms from one individual to another, hence called the vectors. So, a number of diseases being spread by this individual. Now, we have two different species of Indian cockroaches, two different species. The common cockroach, what we call Periplaneta americana. So here there is a spelling mistake. Periplaneta americana. P or I. Periplaneta americana. Then another one, Blata orientalis. Blata orientalis. Now there is one question regarding the female. How can you identify the second organism, Blata orientalis? Now the females are normally vestigial and rudimentary wings. Even sometimes the wings are not. Visible, very rudimentary, very small in nature, not visible. That's why it's called as vestigial. The meaning for vestigial, non-functional, non-functional. Rudimentary, small, not well developed. 
So this is one first. How can you identify the female bladder from the male? That is absence of wings or the wings are present as vestigial and rudimentary organs. Vestigial that is non-functional, rudimentary very small, not well developed. Now what are the other cockroaches available? We have German cockroach and Australian cockroach also found in India. Now Blattella germanica, then Blatta australiaceae. These are also available in India, but they are resembling the cockroach of Australia and then German, Germany, hence called as Blattella germanica. These are all other species. Give importance for this question. A female Blatta has vestigial and rudimentary wings. Now these are all that we have. Now this is Americana, American cockroach. This is oriental, Blatta orientalis, the female cockroach, you can see now no wings. The wings are normally very small and rudimentary. And then just the German cockroach, some are smaller. And then here you see that one, the German. And Australian cockroach, a smaller one. So normally the American is larger, the American cockroach, when compared to what we have, that is uh, Okay, that is actually, this is American cockroach, this is oriental cockroach, that one is German cockroach, that one the Australian cockroach, having brown band, brown band. So you can see, you can identify what we call the black tongue. From this one, actually, this American cockroach, here there are two black patches are present. Here it is absent. We can identify what we call the normal cockroach from the black tongue by the presence of two dark patches found on the surface of a plate what is called pronotum I will come to this, I'll come to this one what is a pronotum plate so that is the difference between these two another difference in the case of female cockroach you wouldn't see there is any wings at all now what is a morphology so the, it is included in insect because the body being divided into three parts or tegmata three parts of tegmata, namely the head, thorax and abdomen. So tegmata, the word used for what is called the segments, the three parts. Now if you are taking the embryo of cockroach, the embryo of cockroach has 20 segments. See that one, it consists of 20 segments. There is 6 segments in the head, 3 segments in the thoracic region and 11 segments in what we call the abdomen. That is in the case of embryo. This is one question, how many segments are present in the case of embryo 20? But in the case of adult, you see the abdomen is having only 10 segments. So altogether only 19 segments in the case of adults. The 11th segment is normally not present in the case of adult. So embryo has 20 segments, 6 segments in the head region, then 3 segments in the thoracic region and 11 segments in the abdomen. But in the case of adult, you have only 10 segments in the abdomen present. So altogether 19 segments in the adult and 20 segments in the case of embryo. Now the exoskeleton. Now in the case of arthropod, in all arthropods, we have an exoskeleton. The hard material present outside the body is called exoskeleton. Now the exoskeleton is made up of a kind of a polysaccharide, what is called chitin. So that's why it's called chitinous exoskeleton. Now this chitin, this chitin, this is chitin. The exoskeleton is made up of chitin, a chemical compound, a heteropolysaccharide. This is a heteropolysaccharide. A heteropolysaccharide. We have one question also regarding this one. Heteropolysaccharide, that is a carbohydrate made up of dissimilar units. Normally, if you are taking the carbohydrates, they are being formed of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, all carbohydrates. So, polysaccharide is a complex carbohydrate. Now, here we have homopolysaccharide and heteropolysaccharide. It is an example of starch or glycogen or cellulose. Starch, cellulose and glycogen. These are all called homopolysaccharide. Made up of similar units, namely glucose. Made up of similar units called glucose. But in the case of uh, heteropolysaccharide, they are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In addition to that one, they are also contain nitrogen. So, chitin is a nitrogen containing sugar. Chitin is a nitrogen containing sugar. 
coming into the group hexose amine. Coming into the group hexose amine. Yeah. Hexose amine. Yeah. So chitin. This is about chitin. The chitin is made up of heteropolysaccharide, made up of dissimilar units because it contains in addition to the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and also nitrogen and nitrogen containing sugar. Chitin is a nitrogen, this is two years back question, the date question paper. Chitin is a nitrogen containing sugar that is a hexose amide, a heteropolysaccharide. Okay, so that's about what we have, that is a chitin, remember that one, a chitin is a nitrogen containing carbohydrate or sugar. That to coming under heteropolysaccharide. That is nothing but heteropolysaccharide. Now, normally this chitinous skeleton that is forming individual plates in each segment, such hardened plates are called sclerites. They are not present as a mole, but a continuous actually, continuous uh, exoskeleton. They are being made up of many plate-like structures. The plates that constitute what we have the exoskeleton together call as sclerites. We have, if you are taking for example the animal, now this is the dorsal sclera. If you are taking the cross section of the animal, this is a dorsal sclera, right? What is called as the terga? Terga. Dorsal sclera. Right? Or tergite. Otherwise called tergite. So each segment, either the thorax or abdomen, either the thorax or abdomen is being formed of two plates, a dorsal plate of tergum or tergite and a ventral plate of sternum, a ventral plate of sternum or sternite. Dorsal plate of tergum and a ventral plate of sternum. And these two are being normally joined by means of a thin elastic membrane. This membrane is called arthroidal membrane. Arthroidal membrane. Arthroidal membrane. In some books it is given arthroidal membrane. Arthroidal membrane. Okay, now this is dorsal plate tergum, a sclerite, and a ventral plate sternum, another sclerite. These two are joined laterally by means of a thin flexible membrane, what is called arthroidal membrane. That's about the arrangement of the skeleton. So commonly called the tergal plates and the sternal plates as sclerites. As sclerites. So in each segment, exoskeleton has hardened into sclerites. And then we have the tergum or tergites dorsally. I mentioned earlier in the diagram. Sternum or sternites ventral. Now the two plates are joined on each side by another membrane, a thin and flexible articular membrane. One which helps in the articulation of the plates. Movement. Articular means here movements. That membrane is called arthroidal membrane. Membrane is called arthroidal membrane. I mentioned already arthroidal or arthroidal membrane. Both are correct. Arthroidal membrane. So that is about the organization of the plates regarding the exoskeleton. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you see we have nearly 19 segments in the adult body. The head is formed by the fusion of six plates. To form a capsule, what is called head capsule, which encloses a so called brain, and also in the head region we have a para componentize, a para antennae. Now, head is triangular, but it is placed at right angles to the body. Suppose this is the body, the head is pointed downwards. Such a head, which is normally placed at right angles to the body, now this is the body of an organism, and this is the head region which is facing downwards, such a body for having the head, the head is directed downwards or placed at right angles to the body is called, you see that one, hyponathus, hyponathus head. So the head is placed at right angles to the body and such a type of actual head is called hyponathus. So it lies anteriorly and at right angles to the longitudinal body axis. This is the longitudinal body axis and this is the head which is being pointed downwards and that is why it is called hyponathus. As I mentioned earlier in the case of embryo as well as in the case of adult, the head is formed with the fusion of six segments. Head is formed, of, formed by the fusion of six segments. And 
The head is formed of six segments as well as six vertebrae of the sclerites or the plates. Together form what is called the head capsule. The head is formed of six segments and so also formed of six sclerites or the hard plates, the chitinous plates. And they together form what is called the head capsule. So we have six sclerites. So what are the six sclerites we have? Now, actually, we have the following arrangement in the head region. The following arrangement in the head region. Suppose you are taking the head. So it is more or less triangular, pointed outwards. It is having what is called a compound eye. More or less a kidney shaped compound eye. This is the compound eye. What we have the compound eye. This is the compound eye. Then we have upper two plates. This is what is called epicranial plates or simply called as epicranium. Simply called as epicranium. So this is called epicranium and that one is formed of two plates. So one and two, epicranium. Then just below it we have a plate. A larger plate, what is called as a fronds. This is what is called fronds. One. And just below it we have what is called the clypeus. This is another one, clypeus. Clypeus, one. Now these are the four plates arranged one after another from dorsal to ventral side or dorsal to the lower side. So two plates, what are called epicranial plates. And then we have fronds, one. And then clypeus, one. And also we have two lateral plates. Now these are all the two lateral plates. What are called genie, singular genie. So we have plate 1, plate 2, plate 3, plate 4, plate 5 and plate 6. So all these actually sclerites join together to form a capsule which encloses the brain. So once again repeat, the head capsule, normally the head is formed of 6 segments. The head capsule is formed of 6 sclerites. They are arranged in that manner, dorsally 2 plates, epicranial plates. Ventrally, just actually see the front one after another, the front side. Now, this is the third one, fronts, and below it we have a large plate, what is called clypeus. That clypeus is connected to what we call the upper lip, what is known as labrum. This is upper lip, not coming into the head capsule. It is a mouth pass, upper lip. So, that's about the head capsule. What are sclerites present? How many? In what position? So, we have a pair of epicranial plates, I mentioned already. A single fronts and then and back again a single clypeus. On either side we have that is the place what are called the cheek sclerites. Cheek sclerites, they're called as a chain all together formed by means of suture joint together. The joint between the what we have the place is called suture, as in the case of our cranial bones. So the head capsule again bears I mentioned a pair of compound eyes and also a pair of antennae. Pair of components, a pair of antennae. Now, what are the appendages present in the head? Related to the mouth parts and also the antenna. Now, we have a thread like antennae, normally two in number, arising from what is called the membranous sockets lying in front of eyes. Lying in front of eyes. Now, just this is the diagram. We have already seen this is a compound eye, and we have this is an antenna. This is an antenna arising from, that is in front of the eye, two antennae, a pair of antennae. Now each antenna consists of the following structures, consists of the following structures. The basal segment, or we have the first segment, this is what is called the scale. This is what is called the scale, the basal segment. And then we have a pedicel, this is a second segment, pedicel, second segment, pedicel. And then we have a multi-segmented, a multi-segmented flagell, a multi-segmented flagell. So, we have the scape, pedicel and multi-segmented flagell. For example, this is the basal segment, scape, and then we have what is called the second segment. And we have what is called a filamentous, multi-segmented flagell. So this is what is called as a pedicel and this is the lower segment what is called as a scape, the basal segment and this one a multi-segmented flagella. 
This is a structure of antenna. They are tactile sense organ and also considered as olfactory sense organ, scale, pedicel, and then flagellum. These are all the three parts of a three parts of that is what we call the antenna. So a pair of thread like antennae arise from actually the membrane is saw case, the cavities lie in front of eyes. Each antenna consists of scale, the first segment, pedicel, the second segment, and flagellum. It is a continuous actual filament structure made up of many segments. Made up of many segments. That's about the arrangement. Now, what is the role of actual antennae? I mentioned already they are organ of tactile and organ of olfactory. So tactile sensation, nothing but a sense of touch. Sense of touch. They are always present actually projecting forward when the animal is moving. If there is any obstruction while well, touched by the antenna, then they are deviating from the direction. So, organ of touch, organ of smell, that is called olfactory sense, organ of smell, olfactory sense. So, antennae are responsible for sense of touch and also feeling the sense of smell. Now, again, they have a number of sensory receptors on the antennal surface. They are used for monitoring the nature of the environment. Is there any change in the environment? So they are used for actually monitoring the environment. Small receptors present on the surface of the antennae. So in addition to the tactile and olfactory sense, they are also concerned with actually just finding is there any change in the environment. That's the role of antennae. They have filament structure, sense of smell and sense of touch. Tactile and the olfactory sense. Now we have, in the case of all insects, we have the mouth parts. The mouth parts are variously modified in different insects. But in all insects, we have the same fundamental structure. If you are taking mouth parts in different insects, for example, in the case of mosquito, it is called piercing and sucking type of mouth parts, a needle-like structure. Or in the case of butterfly, we have siphoning type of mouth parts. Or in the case of housefly, we have sponging and sucking type of mouth parts. We are taking the cockroach and grasshopper, we have biting and chewing type of mouth parts. So, although the mouth parts are variously arranged, variously modified according to the mode of uh, what is called feeding, in all mouth parts we have the basic fundamental structure. That's why normally the mouth parts are examples for homologous organs. The mouth parts of insects are examples for homologous organs. This is related to the evolution. This is related to the evolution. In evolution, in order to support the organic evolution, we have some anatomical structures. They are in the form of homologous organs or another one, analogous organs. Analogous organs. Now, in the case of homologous organs, these organs have same fundamental structure, same origin, but performing different functions. Say an example of our four-limb skeleton, in the case of any mammal. For example, in the case of uh, vertebrates, penguin or in the case of whales. Suppose I am taking whales, today, not the penguin. The whales are dolphins. The four limbs are modified into paddle-like structures for swimming. In the case of horse, the four limbs are used for running. In the case of bat, they are used for what is called flying. In the case of humans, we are using the hand for different purposes. So, what is happening? Organs which have same origin, same fundamental structure, but they are differing in their function. For example, four limbs in whale for swimming, then we have four limbs in bat is for flying, the four limbs in horse is for running, but they are all having the same fundamental structure. You see that one if you are taking the skeleton, humerus, radius, ulna, then we have the wrist bone, the wrist bones called corpus, and then the palm bones called metacarpals, and then the digits. So, same fundamental structure all being derived from the same embryonic tissue, but they perform different function. That is called homologous organs. Now, in the case of mouth parts of cockroach or any insects, we have different types of mouth parts, but all have the same basic fundamental structure. What are the structures you have in the mouth parts? Starting from upper lip, lower lip, the lateral appendages, and also the crushing structure, etc. Now, Normally, the mouth parts are nothing but the modified appendages of the fourth, fifth, and sixth segments. So, the appendages of the fourth, fifth, and sixth segments, 
they are actually modified and along with the hyperpharynx, the so-called tongue, it's not a real tongue, a so-called tongue, from the mouth pass. So the appendages are the fourth, fifth and sixth segments, the lateral appendages during embryonic development. And along with the so-called tongue, what is called hyperpharynx, it is not a true tongue, but it's a false one. Actually, we are considering that one as a so-called tongue. And now, the mouth parts are arranged in such a manner, they are used for actually biting and chewing the food. That's why the mouth parts of cockroach is an example for biting and chewing type. This is one question. What is the type of mouth parts in the case of cockroach? Even the same type of mouth parts we can see in the case of grasshopper too. So biting and chewing type of mouth parts is seen in the case of cockroach and also in the case of grasshopper. Even the case of larva, the caterpillar larva of any silk moth or butterfly or simply moth. The caterpillar larva is also having what we call the biting and chewing type of mouth parts. So not only present the adults like cockroach and grasshopper, but also we have the caterpillar larva of silk moth or butterfly or simply moth. They too have biting and chewing type of mouth parts. This is another question. What is the type of mouth parts? Normally though we have different types of mouth parts, the biting and chewing type of mouth parts is considered as the primitive type. So, in the case of cockroach, the mouth part is described as a primitive type from which only the various other organizations have been developed. Now, it consists of the following actually structures which constitute the mouth parts of cockroach. One, the upper lip, what is called labra. The upper lip called labra. Then we have a pair of mandibles, a hard chitinous space having toothed margin. You see that one hard chitinous plates, present one on either side of the labrum, the upper lip. Then we have a pair of lateral appendages, what is called the maxilla, that is the third one, maxilla. Each maxilla has two basal segments, one is chondo, another one the stripes. This is chondo segments, this is the stripe. Again the stripe has two smaller lobes, they are called outer gallia in the lazenia. This is outer gallia, inner lacinia. So, we have maxilla, each maxilla has two basal segments, called on stripes. And then we have two segments are being placed, two lobes, we can say, not segments, two lobes are being placed on the surface of we have the stripes. One is inner, another one is out. The inner one is called actually lacinia, and outer one is called as a gallia. In addition to that one, it also has what we call five jointed maxillary or five joint. Now here it is given only just one, two, three, but actually we have four. Two plus two plus and then one. So remember that one here there are five segments. So the labial part actually sorry the maxillary part has five jointed five jointed structure. So it is five jointed, not actually three jointed. So, we have to make that one, two plus two plus one, five jointed structure. That is about the maxilla, a pair of structures present on either side, used for actually holding the food and also having some sensory structures for smell. Now, the next one, the lower lip, what is called labia. The lower lip is actually formed of three segments, one after another. Now, the upper segment, prementum, then we have the mentum, the next segment, and the lower segment was for submentum. Prementum, mentum, and submentum. Now, the prementum is actually formed with a fusion of two pairs of lobes. Inner, what is called glossa. Now, this is the glossa, inner glossa. And outer, what is called paraglossa. Just like Kali and Lazenia, here, inner glossa and outer paraglossa. So, we have four altogether lobes. These four lobes are actually fused at the base to form what is called the prement. Now actually we have also here a polyp. Now in the case of labium, it is being formed of three segments. So the polyp here, this is what is called the maxillary polyp, formed of five segments. And now in the case of what we call the labial polyp, it is being formed of what we call three segments, not many. See that one, one, two, three. Here just I actually mentioned. Three only, but it's formed of five segments. Five segments. It's formed of five segments. So the maxillary pulp is formed of five segments. 
the labial pulp is formed of actually three segments. Now we have a chitinous plate present in the buccal cavity that is called hypophagus. At the base of which what we have the salivary ducts open. Now this is the salivary duct opens at the base of the hypophagus. Hypophagus is nothing but a chitinous plate which is considered as a so-called tongue. So the mouth parts consist of upper lip labium, lower lip, sorry, upper lip labrum and the lower lip labium, a pair of maxillary pulp, a pair of sorry, a pair of maxillary, a pair of mandibles, and a single so-called tongue, at the base of which the salivary glands open to release the secretions. Now again, just here is a description of what I mentioned earlier. The mouth parts consist of one, the labrum upper lip. Then, a pair of mandibles, hard chitinous plates having toothed margin. So, the inner margin normally toothed in nature. So, tooth like structure. Then, a pair of first maxillae. Normally, now you have the labium or lower lip is also called a second pair of maxillae. It is also called second pair of maxillae. That is the labium or the lower lip is otherwise called second pair of maxillae. So this is a second name only. So ordinarily it is called a labium or the lower lip. So a pair of first maxillae with the basal segments cardo and stripes and then I mentioned about five jointed maxillary part. Cardo, stripes and five jointed maxillary part. Now the labium and the lower lip it is formed with a few snob second pair of maxillae. Again mention about just uh, rementum, mentum, submentum and then we have glossa and paraglossa, the small lobes and also a three jointed labial pulp. Then the so-called tongue, what we call the hypopharynx. So it is nothing but a cord, a chitinous rod or a cord. So it is a chitinous rod and that is uh, at the base of which is a salivary gland spoken. So chitinous rod like structure, not at all a true tongue. It is unable to move. It is fixed but considered as a tongue as it is found in the buccal cavity. Now the head is over the head capsule the name of you have the sclerites. Now we have to know about the compound isolated under the sense organs. The antennae structure we have the scape, then we have the pedicel and then flagellum. Now coming to the thorax. As a rule now it is being formed of three segments. In almost all the insects the thorax is formed of three segments. The free segments, not fused with one another, connected but not fused. So, the segments are prothorax, mesothorax, and metathorax. Pro, meso, and metathorax. Now, in each segment, there is a dorsal sclerite, what is called terca. Now, the terca, the dorsal plate, in, always in all the segments, including the abdomen, the dorsal plate called as terca or terca. Here, the thorax, the three plates are also named differently with another name, with other names, we can see. Now, the prothorax, now the terca of the prothorax is called pronotum. Then the mesothorax, mesonotum, and then the metathorax, metanotum. So prothorax, mesothorax, and metathorax. The dorsal plate of each segment, named the terbial plate, also called by another name, pronotum, mesonotum, and metanotum. This is another name for the terbial plate of the thoracic plate. Now, of all these three plates, you can find it just over the neck region. The neck region is not visible. This is because of enormously grown, a large size triangular plate formed by the pronotum. Mm -hmm. So the pronotum is triangular and the largest of all the plates and then covering what is called the neck. That's why it's not visible. Suppose we are taking the, this is the head region and this plate what we have, the pronotum. And after all, finally we have the body. So the pronotum is a triangular plate which is the largest sclerite in the animal body. Largest sclerite. See that one. Largest sclerite. When compared to other sclerites. So normally the terrible plates are called pronotum, mesonotum and metanotum. The pronotum forms a large plate like structure more or less triangular even covering, extending into the head and covering the neck region. That is the largest sclerite. Okay, the pronotum. Now, cockroach, the excellent morphology, a simple organization. We have, you see that one, the head ridge. The head is placed normally at right angles with the body axis, hypo, not the stripe. 
having a pair of antennae. Now this is actually the antennae, the filiform antennae, or filiform antennae. A filamentous one having the basal segments. We have the pedicel and the skin, and that one we have the filamentous form. Then the head is followed by you have that one. This is the thoracic region. Now this is what we get. The prothorax is not visible. The prothorax is not visible because of the enlarged sclerite, namely the dorsal plate pronotum. Pronotum in the prothorax. Now the next segment we have the mesothorax. And finally we have the metathorax. So this region is the metathorax. And we have the dorsal plate and ventral plate. Now what are the other structures present in the thoracic region? The thoracic region has a pair of wings and three pairs of wings. So that is the universal character of all insects. The universal character of all insects presents of three pairs of wings and connected to what we call the thoracic region, one pair to each segment. So three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings are present in the thoracic region. Now the first pair of wings, what are called, the four wings are otherwise called tegmina. Tegmina, the word referring to cover. Now when the animal is at rest, now this four wing normally covers the hind wing which is membranous. As it is giving protection to the hind wing, it is called tegmina. So it is normally dark brown, thick, leathery and opaque in nature. Darker in color, thick, leathery and opaque. Not used for flight, only for covering or protecting the membranous hind wing at rest. This is called tegmina, the meaning for that cover. Then we have a pair of hind wings. Now the four wings are connected to what we call the mesothorax, not to the prothorax. The four wings are connected to the mesothorax. The hind wings are connected to the metathorax. The hind wings are connected to the metathorax. The hind wings are normally membranous in nature. They are used for flight. So in the case of, you see that one, uh, drosophila, a fruit fly, or in the case of house flies, or in the case of mosquito. Now the hind wings are reduced. The hind wings are reduced. Only, only one pair of wings, that to their transparent nature, used for flight. And the hind wings are normally reduced in the case of uh, mosquito or house flies. They are called as halters. They are called as halters. The gizzing sound or the buzz sound produced by the mosquito is because of the beating of the halters. So it produces a buzz sound while just flying near the ear region. You can feel that buzz sound. That is because of the halters. The halters are beating, not here in the case of mosquito or in the case of house flies. Okay, now we have two pairs of wings and then three pairs of legs in the thoracic region. The first pair of wings are called tegmina. They are attached to them what is called the mesothorax, used for protection. The second pair of wings are membranous. They are called elytra. They are called elytra. Now this is the four wing. This is the four wing, the first pair of wings. And then we have the hind wing. The four wing is otherwise called stegmina as it covers the hind wings at rest, giving protection to the hind wings. Now we have the hind wings which is membranous, used for flying. And that is called as a elytra. That is called elytra. Now, what are the other structures? I mentioned in the case of thoracic region, we have three pairs of legs. Three pairs of legs. And each leg is normally five joint. Each leg is normally five joint. Okay. Now, what are the regions of the leg? Now, the leg is attached to what is called the thoracic region either to the prothorax or to the mesothorax or to the metathorax. Each leg has five segments. The basal segment by which the leg is attached to the body is called coxa. This is the basal segment, coxa. And in the case of spider, there too we have actually five segmented legs. The basal segment called coxa contains coxal glands in spider, coxal glands which are excreted in function, in the case of spider, the coxal glands, which are excreted in function. Then, next one is small segment, I'll show in the picture now. We have, this is the arrangement, this is the basal segment, somewhat uh, stout in nature, by which the leg is attached to, that is uh, actually the body, 
and there is a small segment present between the coxa to the next segment, the strong segment, femur, that is called trochanter. This is a small segment lying between the coxa and the next segment, femur. The femur is the strongest segment. It is followed by tibia. Now this is the next one. So this is number one, and number two, and number three, and number four, tibia. And again, the last one, five segment tarsus. Last one, five segmented tarsus. The last tarsal segment is actually provided with a pair of claws. A pair of claws. And a soft pad. A soft pad. This soft pad is called actually pulvilus or erroneum. So pulvilus. Another name for this one, pulvilus. This is the erroneum, the soft pad for actually for placing the animal body after flight on the substratum to act as a shock absorber and that is aerolium, otherwise called as a pulvirus. Then, at the base of each tarsal segment, we have a pair of another soft pad. We have a pair of another soft pad present just at the base of each tarsal segment. And this one is called plantulae, soft pad present at the base of the tarsus. At the base of the tarsus, we can say the tarsal segment because the tarsus is five segments, having five tarsal segments. Now we have the plant today, and the soft pad present between what we call the tarsal segments. As I mentioned here, the last tarsal segment bears a pair of claws and a chitinous spongy pad or a soft pad, and that one is called pulvilus on the aerolium, as you seen in the picture. And again, minute pads, soft pads, also called pad plantulae, they are present between the tarsomeres. Tarsomeres, nothing but the tarsal segments, units. So the tarsus is made up of five tarsomeres, the tarsal segments, they are called tarsomeres. And between the tarsomeres, we have another soft pad on the lower surface, what we have the plant. They are also acting as what we have the shock absorber, where the animal is come to rest after the flight on the substrate. As I mentioned earlier, we have the wings. The wings are two pairs. First pair is called the forewing or tegmina attached to. That is the mesothorax. So two pairs of wings are present. The first pair, what we have, the four wings. They are attached to the mesothorax. The second pair of wings are attached to the. the second pair of wings called the hind wings are attached to. That is a metathorax, what I described earlier. Now, again, once again, just ask for the nose. What is the nature of the four rings? They are otherwise called as tegmina, a hard one, tough one, dark in color, okay, opaque in nature. So, thick, opaque, dark, and leathery in nature. And the function is covering and protecting what we call the hind wings, hence called tegmina. The meaning for tegmina, covering. The hind wing, these are all membranous structures found attached to the metathorax and are used for flight. The function is for flight. So that's about the thoracic region, formed of three segments, two pairs of wings and one pair of legs to each segment, altogether three pairs of legs. Now the abdomen. In the embryo, the abdomen is normally 11 segmented, but in adult, it is being 10 segmented. The last segment is being represented by portical plates. Now, the 10th abdominal segment has no stone, one of the characters, no stone. So, the dorsal plate is called tergum and the ventral plate is called sternum. In all the segments up to 9, we have dorsal plate and then ventral plate. But in the case of 10th segment, they have only the dorsal plate, namely the tergum and the ventral plate, the sternum is absent. Now, a pair of small plates, suppose you are taking the cockroach, this is what we have the 10 segments, we have a pair of plates present, like this, a pair of plates present, and the last, attached to the last actually the segment, the sternum particularly, so they are called as a portical place, that is below the 10th sternum. So the 10th sternum is normally reduced or absent, and below the 10th sternum we have a pair of portical plates, these are all called the portical plates. This is the abdomen. So this is what we call the tenth segment. A parapodical place also present just below the sternum where the sternum is normally reduced absent in the tenth segment. Now we have, in the case of both male and female cockroaches, we have 
a 15 segment a 15 segment structure is present a 15 segment structure is present that is called anal cell side having some auditory receptors auditory sensilla concerned with feeling the sense of vibrations on earth so that is actually 15 segment they are called appendages the name anal cell side they arise actually the junction between arise from the junction between the ninth and tenth seconds ninth and tenth seconds so they are arising between the ninth and tenth second suppose it's a tenth segment now this is the ninth segment now this is arrangement so tenth segments on the dots side one on each side in both male and female so on the anal cells i mentioned actually they have the sensory receptors they are actually concerned with auditory sense hence or auditory sensilla or photo sorry phonoreceptors phono means a receptor concerned with the reception of the sound vibrations as sound so our ears are called the phonoreceptors so anyway now on the cells a present sensory actually structures they are called auditory sensilla concerned with perceiving the sound vibrations from the earth that's why they are called as phonoreceptors and they are capable of receiving the sound waves just from the vibrations of uh, what is called the earth so auditory sensilla or we have what is called the phonoreceptors are present on the surface of the anal cells both in male and females now this is what we have this is the 10th segment this is the 9th segment here between the 9th and 10th segment we have this structure between this structure this is normally what we have segment 15 segment arising dorsally between the 9th and the 10th segment here only we have the auditory sensilla concerned with what we have the sound vibrations. It is found both male and females. Now I mentioned about you see that one just below the tenth sternum we have the podical place. This is what is called the podical place. Podical place. So that's about the organization just at the posterior end related to some structures. Now we have that is both male and female, the anal cells are present. And that is the organ for auditory perception, concerned with what we have receiving the sound vibrations. Now, in the case of female, if you want to analyze and differentiate the male and female cockroaches, normally the abdomen of female is very broad. This is number one. When compared to the male, the male abdomen is narrow. The female abdomen is very broad and the male abdomen is narrow. Now, in the case of female, the seventh sternum that is on the what is called ventral side is large and bowl shaped. Now, along with this one, the eighth and ninth sternum it forms a brood pouch or a genital pouch. So, here only we have the fertilization and also somehow just not fertilization. There you have only that brood pouch contains the female genital aperture. The eggs are being laid through this what is called the brood pouch only. And we have the spermatical pores, a structure concerned with the storage of spores. They only open into the brood pouch. And also a pair of highly branched collateral glands open into the brood pouch. So the brood pouch or genital pouch is nothing but the board shaped seventh segment, the seventh sternum, along with an eight. So it is being intact tucking it of the seventh segment, large in shape, that is more shape, it joins with the eighth and ninth sternum to form what is called the brood pouch, otherwise called genital pouch. So in which we have the follic openings, the male genital pore, the openings of spermatheca, the one which receives the sperm during copulation and storing it, that is called spermatheca, and also a pair of highly branched collateral glands open into the genital pouch. So genital pore, the spermatical pores and collateral glands open into the genital pores. That is nothing but the seventh sternum along with ninth and eighth. Then fertilization and formation of Kothika always occurs in genital pores. The fertilization, that is the union of male and female gametes, and then also the egg case. Because the eggs which are laid are encased by means of a thick covering, what is called Uthika. So the formation of Uthika 
and also the fertilization process found to occur only in the genital pouch, a one which is formed by the seventh sternum along with eight and nine. I am using along with because the major part is formed by the seventh sternum only, a little part only provided by eighth and ninth star. <coughs> now, in the case of evil cockroach, just near the genital pouch, we have three pairs of chitinous plates helping in fertilization. And they are called gonopophyses. Three pairs of chitinous plates are present. So one pair in the eighth sternum, the remaining two pairs in the ninth sternum. So they are present just in around what we call the genital pouch. Their main function is actually differentiating the male from female and also used for some of fertilization for the reception of the spore. They act as what we call just like copulative organs, not copulative organs, but something like that only because these are all the plates. For the reception of the sperm from the male cockroach, they are used. So, already the three pairs of gonopophyses, chitinous plates, present in female around the genital pouch, concerned with the reception of the sperm. Now, I mentioned already they concerned with the actual reception of the sperm, that means during copulation. The function is copulation and formation of uthika and also formation, just actually placing the eggs at right place, placing the eggs after fertilization in the right place, that is called ovic position. So anyway, now we have the genital pouch into which we have the spermatical pores, the genital pore and collateral glands open. And surrounding the genital pouch, we have three pairs of chitinous plates, they are called gonopophyses. In the case of male, they are also called gonopophyses, but also with another name, fellow males. Here they are called gonopophyses. Present we have in the 8th and 9th sternum 1 plus 2. And what is the function? Normally they are used for copulation, used for the formation of Uthika along with what we call the genital pouch. And also placing the egg at the right place in the substratum, that process is called oviposition. That process is called oviposition. So in male, the genital pouch lies at the hind end, not in the seventh segment, it is present at the hind end. So in the case of female only, we have the root pouch. The genital pouch present in the seventh segment, but here in the case of male, it is formed at the hind end of the abdomen. So, formed just actually, it is being bound by ninth and tenth trigger and ventrally by ninth stone. So, dorsally by ninth and tenth terrible plates and ventrally by the ninth stone. So, the root pouch like the genital pouch is present. So, we have the genital pouch in the case of male at the hind end, not in the seventh segment and bounded by actually 9th and 10th terga dorsally and then 9th sternum ventral. Now it contains the following openings unlike the male. It contains anus dorsally, the male genital pore ventrally and also we have gonopophyses or phalomias. Again here there are three phalomias. Okay now dorsal anus or genital pore ventrally and also we have the phalomias or gonopophyses, the chitinous place used for actually transferring the sperm are also present in the genital pouch, unlike the genital pouch of female. There it is found in the seventh, here it is found, you see that one ninth and tenth, along with the ninth sternum. So there are three phalomias, otherwise called as gonopophyses. And these are all asymmetrical structure made up of chitin. And normally they are surrounding the male gonopho concerned with the copulation. So in males, one on the ventral side and one each on the lateral sides. So if there too in the case of females, we have three gonopophyses. There it is not called phalomias. Here only it is called in the case of male, the gonopophyses are called phalomias. They are actually asymmetrical structures, chitinous plates used for copulation. Now males, they pair up unjointed needle-like structure. That is the differentiation between the male and female. So the male and female animals exhibit sexual dimorphism. We can differentiate the male from the tough female in having what is called the brood pouch in the case of female and absent in the case of male. And secondarily, the abdomen of female is broad and the abdomen of male is narrow. And the third one, we have a needle-like structure present in the case of male and that one called the styles. Anal styles. They are present in the ninth stone. Ninth stone. See, anal cells are present between the ninth and tenth and now this is present in the ninth sternum, just arising, just ventrally from the sternal plate. And we have the anal cells present dorsally in between the ninth and tenth, what we have the terminal plates. So these are all some of the external morphological characters between the male and female. So this is about what we have.
Now, how to compare the male and female? Male is having a narrow abdomen, a female is having a broader abdomen. Then in the case of male, the gentle pouch is present at the hind end and in the case of female, it is present in the seventh stone. Now in the case of male, we have anal styles are present, in female, the anal styles are absent. These are the three main differences we can make it between the male and female. Okay, now with that I conclude the external morphology, how to proceed about the various internal anatomy and organization, the different systems in cockroach tomorrow. Okay.